Around 5.30 p.m., Jimmy and Rolf left Blackwell's Corner and headed up over the hill to another small town called Shalam. Again, everyone pronounces the name of this town differently, but I choose to use the pronunciation I hear from my buddy Matthew Grant, who not only grew up there, but his grandmother ran the post office a half mile from the crash site. She also worked with Sieti Onishi, another name I am sure to be pronouncing wrong, and together they got the James Dean Memorial built and installed in its current location. With no traffic cameras and no film crew around, we can only surmise exactly what happened at 5.45 p.m. on Friday, September 30th, 1955, at the intersection of Highway 466 and 41. We know that both James Dean and Donald Turnipseed, the young college kid who hit James Dean, had passed cars just before the accident. We know that the speed limit was 55 miles an hour, but no one travels that slow going cross country through California's hot Central Valley, especially in September. We also know that Bill Hickman and Sanford Roth, Jimmy's travel companions, got to the crash site about 10 minutes after the wreck. The distance from Blackwell's Corner to Shalam is just about 30 miles. At 60 miles an hour, this should take about 30 minutes. According to Lee Raskin's book, James Dean on the Road to Salinas, Jimmy and his friends left Blackwell's Corner at 5.30 p.m. Jimmy and Rolf crashed in Shalam at 5.45 p.m. Sanford Roth and Bill Hickman arrived 10 minutes later at 5.55 p.m. That means that the station wagon covered 28 miles in 25 minutes, which would make sense if you're driving 60 miles an hour in a new Ford station wagon with a V8. All of this means that if James Dean went from Blackwell's Corner to Shalam in 15 minutes, he had to be going 120 miles an hour. It is simple math and physics. The only way for an object to cover 30 miles in 15 minutes is to travel at 120 miles an hour. And keep in mind that 120 is an average speed. James Dean most likely just filled up the tank. You can't expect a small car with a full tank of gas, two adult men, and just over 100 horsepower to travel 120 miles an hour uphill on a winding road. But, coming downhill in a straight line, all that weight works in your favor. So if he was driving less than 120 going uphill from Blackwell's, then he had to be going faster than 120 coming downhill into Shalam to average 120 miles an hour. James Dean supposedly told Bruce Kessler at the gas station that he had already gone over 120 miles an hour on the way up from Hollywood. Remember the top speed for a 1955 Porsche Spider is nearly 140 miles an hour. So you do the math. Whatever the speed, the end result was still the same. James Dean passed Mr. and Mrs. White in their Pontiac just before the crash. They said they were traveling around 65 miles an hour when the Spider passed them like they were standing still, or in excess of 85 miles an hour. Donald Turnipseed was driving home from school in his 1950 Ford two-door. As he approached the Y-shaped intersection heading east, he started to turn left across traffic onto Highway 41 North. There is no traffic light or stop sign heading east or west on 466, and Highway 41 just veers off to the left if you are heading east on 466, so you don't need to slow down much to make the turn. Stories differ on Turnipseed's actions. Supposedly, he starts the turn thinking he has plenty of time before the spider gets to the intersection. Then he backs out of the turn after he realizes the spider is approaching way faster than he thought. Jimmy turns to avoid the Ford, but it is too late. Just missing a direct head-on collision, the Ford hits the driver's side of the spider with its left front corner. The impact reportedly flips the Porsche into the air and launches Rolf out of the car. Both land off the road many yards away. The front left wheel of the Ford is smashed nearly all the way up to the firewall. The Ford spins around and slides backwards 39 feet as it continues on its path eastward. The driver's door on the Porsche is completely destroyed and Jimmy and the steering wheel are both smashed up against the passenger side of the car. His feet were crushed and trapped under the brake and clutch pedals. His arms, legs, neck and skull have been broken in several places. Jimmy had pieces of broken glass in his face. The spider's windshield was plexiglass and his glasses were reportedly found away from the car, so the only place the glass could have come from was the headlight of the Ford. Since the driver's door of the Porsche and the front corner of the Ford near the headlight took the brunt of the impact, 
then it is safe to assume that the last thing Jimmy saw was the headlight of the Ford hitting him in the face at over 100 miles an hour. Again, look at the height of the driver's head while sitting in the Spider, and the height of the front headlight on a 1950s Ford. So you gotta ask yourself one question. How fast does a 1300 pound aluminum car need to be going to create enough force to smash the front suspension all the way up to the firewall on a 3200 pound car made from heavy Detroit steel? When a car covers 30 miles in 15 minutes, which in simple math is an average speed of 120 miles an hour, I gotta believe he was doing anywhere from 85 to 120 miles an hour. Believe what you want, but go out and try and smash the front fender, cross member, and suspension of a 1954. I rest my case. As I look at all the evidence and my own personal experience, I have taken a second thought about Donald Turnipseed. Yes, I think he was speeding, but that is anything over 55 miles an hour. Yes, he had a two-tone paint job and supposedly new racing intake manifold on his car, which would mean he was a hot rodder. Yes, he was probably in a hurry to get home after a week at school. I'm sure he was not expecting to see a two-foot-tall silver race car approaching him on a two-lane highway at over 100 miles an hour. So he misjudged the closing speed of the two cars and their inability to occupy the same space and time in the universe. But Jimmy was at fault also. He was speeding. He was not wearing a seatbelt, but I don't think that would make a difference in this case. He was probably in a hurry to get to Paso Robles to meet his friends for dinner. And he just made a public service announcement about not driving fast on the street because you don't know what the other guy is going to do. You always have to be on the alert and as they say, leave yourself an out. It is what Doctor Who calls a fixed point in time. It is one of the iconic points in mankind. It was and will always be meant to be. You cannot change what happened, even if you wanted to. As much as we would love to go back and change history, it would probably destroy the fabric of space and time. So we are left with what might have been. Also, the story that James Dean said he's got to see us just before the crash is totally bogus. The only person who would have heard him say that was Rolf. James Dean's friend and racing buddy Lou Bracker told me that Rolf did not speak any English. So, Rolf's English was bad at best, and he had said many times that he did not remember anything just before or after the crash. I think you can understand now why James Dean fans all around the world, myself included, are so fascinated by this event.